Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Praise God, today we are into the beginning of our fourth week of teaching verse by verse through the book of Philippians. I had intended for this to be a four-week series, and I've still got a little bit over a chapter to go. I'm going to try and speed up, but uh, I'll just go until I finish. But we've got this little book that's like a 120-page book that is a verse-by-verse -verse teaching through the book of Philippians. I'm offering this to you as a free gift. And then we also have DVDs and CDs that were taken from a conference where I taught verse-by-verse -verse through Philippians. And then you can also get these exact television programs. If there was something that the Lord spoke to you specifically through this television program, you can get these exact programs on DVD, CD, or a USB. We are now in Philippians chapter 3, and I ended with verse 17 last week where it says, Brethren, be ye followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us as an example. Boy, that, that is powerful to think that a minister would say, you, you measure everybody else by me. And you got to remember that this is the same man that just a few verses before in Philippians chapter 3, verse 3 says, I have no confidence in the flesh. Paul had no confidence in himself in the natural. He had counted all of his accomplishments like dung, but on the other hand, he was so confident of God's power working in him that he says, you use me as a standard and you measure everybody up to the way I'm living and speaking the word. Most people see those things as opposites. How can you have both of those things in you? You can do this. You can get to where you have no confidence in the flesh, and yet you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. I have no confidence in myself, but through Christ, man, I'm doing things constantly that are way, way, way beyond my natural self and ability. Anyway, I need to speed up, but that is powerful. In verse 18, it says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Paul here is going to begin to say some really harsh things towards some people that had opposed him and had opposed what he was teaching. But he says, I'm telling you now, even weeping. This shows you that he wasn't doing it out of his flesh. This wasn't him out of vengeance, trying to get even. Somebody had hurt him, so he wanted to hurt them. No, he loved these people. He was saying this out of love. He found no pleasure whatsoever, and yet he would stand up and speak the truth. And he says, Anybody who's preaching another gospel unto you than that which I've preached, let him be accursed. That's in Galatians chapter 1, and that's such a radical statement that I'm sure he probably thought people thought he couldn't mean what it looks like he's saying. So he says, again, I say, if anybody preaches any other gospel unto you than that which I have preached, let him be accursed. Man, Paul, he was strong, and he knew who he was, and he began to start rebuking some people, but he wasn't doing it out of anger. He was doing it out of love. He was doing it for the Philippians' benefit so that they wouldn't be deceived, and he took no pleasure in exposing the error of these other people. In verse 19, he's talking about these people who uh, were the enemies of the cross of Christ. Did you know when it says that they are an enemy of the cross of Christ, that doesn't mean that they were the enemy of the piece of wood that they crucified Jesus on. When the Scripture uses the term the cross of Christ, when Paul says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's not talking about the piece of wood. What he's referring to is that the cross is where Jesus died and took all of God's wrath and judgment against sin, the sin of the entire human race upon him. The cross is referring to the fact that Jesus paid it all, that I don't have to pay. All I have to do is believe and receive. But I, it's not up to me. It's not up to my self-righteousness. It's up to me trusting in Him. And so that's what he's talking about. They are enemies of the finished work of Christ. They are preaching that you still have to live holy, and unless you live holy, God won't answer your prayer. God won't save you. It's based on your performance. Those are people that are the enemy of the cross of Christ. And those people, it says in verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame who mind earthly things. Did you know that these things that he's saying right here, most people don't even consider this that bad. 
But Paul was saying these things to blast these people whose end is destruction. They were eventually going to be re rejected by God, whose God is their belly. Man, I think that there's a lot of us that could repent over our God being our belly, that we, we let our flesh dictate to us what we eat, how much we eat, when we eat, and stuff. And I don't believe that this is uh, limited to food, but it's just talking about that they live their life to satisfy themselves. It's all about satisfying themselves. This is the antithesis of what Paul had been talking about in this third chapter. And then he said their glory is in their shame. Again, there's multiple ways that you could take this, but I believe in the context he's talking about people who were approaching God through the righteousness of the law, through self-righteousness, and they were glorying in their performance. But did you know that all of our performance, again, I've used this verse previous, but in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, all of our righteousness is like a filthy rag and people who are trusting in their accomplishments and saying, I am really a good person. You are glorying in your shame. You, are glory You're, you might be better than I am, but compared to what God intended us to be, there's not a one of us that is worthy of standing before God based on our own righteousness. So they are glorying in their shame. They don't look at it as shame, but from God's standpoint, you at your very best are nothing. You know, there's a passage of Scripture that says man at his best is altogether vanity. And on and on we could go with Scriptures like that. People who are trusting in their goodness, man, they, they're looking at things in a relative sense, comparing themselves among themselves and measuring themselves by themselves, which the Bible says is not wise. Compared to somebody else, I might look good. But the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We aren't going to be compared to me or to somebody else. We're all going to be compared to Jesus. And compared to Jesus, you are a mess. I'm a mess at your very best. I don't care if you're living a holier life than most people. Compared to Jesus, you've come short. And if you are glorying in all of your accomplishments and just so pleased with yourself and who you are, you are glorying in your shame. And then the last thing he says in this verse is, they mind earthly things. Did you know most people just think, well, man, that's what you got to do to live in this life. It's, it's wrong. He's putting this down as a, as a put down on people that they mind earthly things. You know, Colossians chapter 3 says, if you be risen with Christ, Set your affection on things above and not on things of this earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Over in 1 John chapter 2, it says, If you love the world, then the love of the Father isn't in you. And again, this goes contrary to so many Christians. So many Christians are all caught up with their movies, with their games, with their things that they have, with their toys, with their house, with their car, with their vehicles, their hobbies, and they just pour their life into it. Did you know there's nothing wrong with any of those things in their proper place? But it, it's way out of balance with most people. Did you know that there are a lot of people that they know so much about all of the football season that, man, they do this fantasy football. They know every player. They can sit there and they do these things. And yet they say, I just can't remember Scripture. And yet they can remember the uh, statistics on somebody, you know, from back 20 years ago, and this person was the most valuable, and who won the Super Bowl. They can remember all of that stuff, but they can't remember Scripture. There's nothing wrong with their brain. There's something wrong with their focus. There's nothing wrong with football, baseball, anything in, in its proper place. But when you get to where you know more and you can quote who, who is the major league batting, champion in 1953, but you can't quote a scripture. You can't remember where it is. You love the things of this earth. You have minded them. Your focus is on that, and that's way out of balance. I know many of you don't like what I'm saying, but I'm just saying what the Word says, that the, these are people whose God is their belly. They're just in it for themselves. They are glorying in their shame. They are taking pride in their own accomplishments and they mind earthly things. You are just completely consumed with the things of this world. Your mind isn't set on things above. 
In verse 20, it says, For our conversation, and the word conversation here is not just talking about words. It's talking about your lifestyle, your manner of living is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is saying that he, he wasn't minding earthly things. Now, in a sense, you have to think about some things. You have to think about what you're going to eat. You have to think about what clothes you're going to put on. If you are going someplace, you got to think about making some plans, maybe a reservation. This isn't saying that you don't ever think about things, but it's saying that your focus is on heavenly things. That as he's saying, our conversation there, his manner of life, everything about him was in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, Jesus Christ. And then verse 21 says, Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things. Again, this has to be taken in a relative sense. You know, these bodies are awesome. It is amazing. I know some of you will think I'm weird, but I think you're weird for just taking things for granted. But I, I, it wasn't just a week or so ago. I was looking at my hand and just thinking about this is amazing how God created our hands and what we're able to do. And I was thinking about my fingernails. I was cutting my fingernails and thinking about how, how they grow. And I know that they, and some people will think, boy, you're weird. I'm just amazed at this body. And yet this says it's a vile body. That has to be taken in a relative sense. Just like the previous statement about minding earthly things, to some degree we all have to think about earthly things, but compared to the amount of time and attention I put on the things of God, I don't mind earthly things relative to how much time I spend thinking about the things of God. Likewise, this body is actually awesome. It is amazing the way that God created our body, but compared to the body that we're going to have, this is a vile body. That's amazing. The word vile here means depression in rank or feeling. This is depressed compared to what it's going to be. When we get a glorified body, we'll be able to zip from place to place. Jesus was able to walk through walls, appear and disappear in His glorified body. I tell you, our glorified body is going to be awesome. So it says, He will change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body according to the working whereby He is able to even to subdue all things unto Himself. To change this vile body that is subject to all of the weaknesses and the problems that we have into a glorified body that is incapable of being sick, that can do all of these things, that just looks impossible, but God is able to do it. God is able to subdue all things unto Himself. So going into chapter 4, the final chapter in the book of Philippians, it says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. You know, I made this point when we were in the first chapter, but the book of Philippians was written to Paul's partners. Right here in this fourth, fourth chapter, in verse 15 and 16, he says that the Philippians were the only people that ever supported him after he left the local area. And they sent to him numerous times in uh, Thessalonica and then even in Rome. They helped pay for a house that he lived in, a hired house as he was a prisoner for two years. These were people that were special to him. And you can see this in this verse when he refers to them as my dearly beloved longed for his crown, and then again, he says they're dearly beloved. And he says in verse 2, I beseech you odious. These are both feminine names, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. These were women that were at somehow or another, they were at odds with each other. And again, we could spend more time on this, but Paul had already said this a number of times in the book of Philippians, that he wanted unity among the believers. It, we just tolerate things today that God never intended for us to tolerate. He said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples by your love one for another. I tell you, unity among the believers ought to be much more important, and that's what Paul is beseeching these two women to do. And then in verse 3, he says, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, talking about two believers there who had... Uh, yielded themselves to the Lord. They had taken the Lord's yoke upon them and they were serving the Lord to help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. 
You know, there's, there's a lot of speculation about this. Clement is considered to be the first bishop of Rome and that he was uh, martyred and that he was a very godly man. But that's all extra biblical material. And it may all be true, but I just don't put the same credence. I don't spend a lot of time studying extra biblical material. This is the only time that Clement is mentioned in the Bible, but this is very possible that this is a guy who became the bishop over Rome, who was uh, martyred and uh, was just a powerful man of God. And Paul is making mention of him. In verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I think the reason he says again, I say rejoice, is because people were thinking, You can't rejoice in the Lord always at all times. He must not mean that. And so he says, again, I say rejoice. He repeated it just so that nobody would miss this. And you've got to remember that Paul was in prison when he was writing this. He had been in prison a minimum of three years. He spent two years in prison in Judea. He spent a year in transit on his way to Rome. And we don't know exactly how long he had been in prison in Rome, but he had been in prison at least three years, maybe up to five years, because he spent two years in prison in Rome, and writing from prison, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Did you know most people believe that we are supposed to rejoice in the Lord? And they will do it if everything's going good, but if something bad happens, they feel justified in not rejoicing in the Lord. They said, You can't rejoice in the Lord when bad things happen. Paul said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And that word always. In the Greek, it means at all times, under every circumstance. You know, I was talking to a woman one time whose husband was divorcing her, and I was telling her that she needed to just rejoice in the Lord. And she says, how could I rejoice? I said, if nothing else, rejoice in the fact that the Bible says in heaven, they don't marry, nor are given in marriage. Rejoice in the fact that, man, these marital problems are temporary. They aren't going to last forever. If we were to look at things in the light of eternity, did you know whatever you're dealing with today, I don't care how bad it is, it's temporary. It's going to be over. And someday you'll be compensated so much. Somebody might be watching today who's dying. You got stage four cancer and you're sitting there, how could I rejoice? Well, rejoice that, praise God, in heaven there's not going to be any sickness, there's not going to be any sorrow, there's not going to be any pain. I believe that God wants you well. And I would believe for healing, but if for whatever reason you don't see that healing manifest, you're going to spend eternity in the presence of God and you can rejoice. If you're poor today, you may say, how can I rejoice? Well, rejoice because God's building a mansion for you in heaven. I believe you can prosper in this life, but if for whatever reason you don't see it happen in this life, you can rejoice. So Paul is writing from prison. And did you know that the book of Philippians it has more mention of rejoice, joy, rejoicing than any other letter that Paul wrote. I think there's 16 or 17 times in this epistle that he mentions rejoicing in the Lord. Did you know that joy is a, ver uh, a noun, but rejoicing is a verb? What that means is that you may not always feel something. You may not always have joy, but you can rejoice at all times. It's something that you can do. And I tell you, there are times like when my son died, I didn't feel like rejoicing. I felt like crying. But man, I just decided that this verse came to mind, rejoice in the Lord always. And I just started praising God started thanking God. I said, Father, I thank you. I believe my son's coming back from the dead, but if he doesn't, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord always. And when you start doing that, it says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, it says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, verse 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, abounding therein with thanksgiving as you have been taught. I believe that when it says abounding therein, it's saying you abound in faith with thanksgiving. Man, that's important. You could say it this way. If you aren't thanking the Lord, if you aren't rejoicing, then your faith isn't abounding. If you want your faith to abound, if you want to operate in your most holy faith, you need to start praising God. And it doesn't matter what's going on. When I started praising God about my son, 
uh, being dead and I was going to praise God anyway. Did you know God quickened scripture to me? He quickened prophecies to me. And Jamie and I prayed and my son was raised from the dead after being dead for over four hours in a morgue, in a cooler, stripped naked with a tote tag on, pronounced dead over four hours before and he was raised from the dead. Man, that's awesome. And I don't believe it would have happened if I hadn't have been rejoicing in the Lord. Rejoicing in the Lord is a way to break free out of your problems. You need to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. You know the word moderation here, it literally means mild, appropriate or mild. In other words, we shouldn't be to extremes. There are people that will go to huge extremes. There needs to be a consistency, just a, a moderation. You know, in dress, you will see some religious orders that go back to the 1500s and all of the women have to dress that way and pile their hair up and wear no makeup and look bland and stuff. Did you know that that's not moderate? The very word modest comes from a word that we get moderation from. Or maybe it's moderation comes from the word modest. But anyway, they're linked is the point. And if you are extreme, if you are going back to the 1500s, you aren't moderate, you aren't modest. There needs to be moderation. And we need to let our moderation be known unto all men. The NIV translates this as gentleness is what it's talking about. And notice it says it needs to be known unto all men. It doesn't need to be hidden. This is something we need to let our lifestyle be made known unto people and we need to be able to give God the credit for it. I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel and the programs that we have available. And I want to encourage you that you can get the materials that we've offered. Also, I'd like to encourage you to like our program and subscribe to what we're doing. We have a lot of material and I believe it'll be a real blessing to you. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you.